So without further ado, our message this morning is simply entitled, When the Music Stops. When the Music Stops. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Dear Lord, one more time we are about to encounter you and your word. And Lord, one more time we ask that you'll touch our hearts and ears and make them into receptive vessels. Lord, my prayer is that no trace of I be found, for we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Daniel chapter 5 and verse 27 perhaps is a well-known verse. Daniel chapter 5 and verse 27, um, it's just a few lines. But it's so pertinent for our message today. Daniel chapter 5 and verse 27. It says, Tico, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Tico, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Today we zoom in on a great high society banquet. You know the type, the ones where the red carpet is laid out. You know the type, the ones where polished black limos are seen dropping the guests off. You know the type where the men have their finest tuxedos. The ones with the shiny lapels and the shiny black stripe down the side of their trousers with coordinated black patent leather shoes. You know the type where the ladies compliment the men with their Versace, Vinay, Valentino, Vivian Westwood gold label ball gowns. You know the type. The ones where the paparazzi are trying to outdo each other with the longest zoom lenses and the latest photographic technology. You know the type of high society banquet, the type where all kinds of reporters would have been there, including perhaps Hello Magazine. Today we zoom in on an ancient banquet held in Babylon some centuries ago. And when we consider the host, we name him as Belshazzar, the young, the flamboyant and haughty king. And as we look on, we see the palace is ablaze. We see long tables set up for thousands of guests. We see the light just glistening from the polished gold, silver candelabras. We look closely and we see the most prominent people. We see all kinds of royalty. We see generals and politicians. We see bankers and admirals. We see all kinds of prominent people. They're all decked out, bejeweled and bedazzled, fingers, arms and necks all blinged up to the hilt. The air is heavy with the finest of eau de perfume or eau de toilette, the airwaves hold up and they hold down some serious vibes. Half-clad dancers just dropping it hard as they weave in and out amongst the tables. Laughter and jokes just bouncing forth, back and forth, and we see a proper hardcore banquet held way back in Babylon. I mean, if anyone knew how to throw a bash, it was Belshazzar. The king and his guests were hitting the liquor hard. And to be honest, they were getting more and more intoxicated and inebriated by the moment. The king just felt good that he pulled off such a function. He felt good that his guests were in the swing and having a grand time. You know, many parties today, they have phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase one where everyone is greeted and a couple of speeches are made and there's a little background music. 
A phase two where the food is dished out and at the end of the eating, the music gets into a different gear. And then there's phase three where everything is stepped up and the chairs are cleared away and the tempo of the music is stepped up and by this time, you can see who everyone is. Well, it was the same with King Belshazzar's party. He had so many phases and every phase just got higher and higher and higher. And at one point there seemed a little bit of a dull moment. There seemed a lull in the festivities and Belshazzar thought he would do something just to step up the pace. He called one of his stewards, whispered a command in his ear and his stewards left the room the guests saw and somehow wondered what would happen next. What did Belshazzar have up his sleeve? And so they just watched. And the steward returned. And in his possession this time, he had with him the cups of gold and silver, which his grandfather had carried away from the temple of Jehovah when he had ransacked the city of Jerusalem. Belshazzar shouted, Fill him up. Fill him up. He shouted, fill him up and drink to your king. In fact, the Bible says it this way in Daniel 5, 1 to 4. It says, Belshazzar, the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple, out of the house of God which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, <coughs> his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. The merriment became more boisterous. Everyone was shouting and drinking and laughing. I believe drink does funny things to you. And we could almost hear them cry out, who is this God of the Jews? Uh, we can almost hear them shouting out, where is this God of the Jews? We can almost hear them shouting out, who is Israel? We are the master race now. Uh, have another drink from the sacred cups of the temple. My friends, as Belshazzar lifted up the golden vessel, as he drew it close to his mouth, as Belshazzar was about to take a sip from the sacred golden vessel that he had desecrated his eyes, his eyes now caught sight of the wall. In fact, the music stopped, the smooching stopped, the laughter stopped, the binging stopped. In fact, everything stopped for all eyes fell upon the wall. Friends, let me tell you what they saw. It stunned them and startled them. What they saw astonished and astounded them. Friends, what they saw surprised and deemed every one of them speechless. In silence, everybody looked and everybody saw a hand, a hand without arm or body. Everybody saw a hand writing in big letters upon the wall. In horror, the king stared at the wall. It looked as if he was going to faint. He looked pale in shock. He began to shake. His knees began to churn. His bowels churned over in astonishment. What on earth does this thing mean? It was as if he had seen a doppy. A ghost, a zombie, nothing like this had ever happened before. In fact, Daniel 5 and uh, verse 5 and 6 puts it this way. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand 
and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. And then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. Friends, the music stopped and the king was frightened out of his wits. The Bible says in Daniel 5, 7 to 9, <coughs> the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. And then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. Friends, look at the picture. Belshazzar calls in his wise men. He feels that they can give him an understanding of what has just happened. Surely if anyone can make this happening plain, they can. <coughs> And they come into his presence ready to gain new favor with the king. But when they see the handwriting on the wall, their countenance fades, their confidence dissolves. They just don't understand it. And this leaves Belshazzar even more shaken up. Let me make it plain for you to see. The music stopped abruptly in Belshazzar's party and he's left frightened. Daniel 5, 10 to 12. Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house. And the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. <coughs> there is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of of the holy gods and in the days of thy father light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods was found in him whom the king Nebuchadnezzar thy father the king I say thy father made master of the magicians astrologers Chaldeans and soothsayers for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he shall show the interpretation. The queen comes in, and the queen states, there is a man. She states, there is a man. Friends, that's good news. Because you can read the Bible from cover to cover and for every situation you will discover that God always has a man. A man who stands up and a man who stands out and a man who stands alone. And so Daniel steps in and steps up and Daniel speaks boldly. You see God's man can always speak boldly because God is on his side. <clears throat> Daniel says, keep your gifts. But let me tell you why this thing happened. He says, remember your grandfather, King Nebuchadnezzar. Remember how God blessed him. Remember how in spite of God's blessing, he turned away from God. Remember how he was humbled and then he turned back to God. Daniel says, in spite of what you have seen and know, you have lifted up yourself against God. You haven't glorified him. You haven't worshipped him. Instead, you've had the audacity and the unmitigated gall to take the sacrifice vessel, the sacred vessels out of God's house 
and to use them to drink wine from while you praise the gods of wood and stone. That's the reason for these things to be written on the wall. Listen to the word of God, Daniel chapter 5, 22 and 23. The Bible says, And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, <coughs> thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold of brass, iron, wood and stone which see not nor hear nor know and the God in whose hand thy breath is and whose are all thy ways hast thou not glorified friends listen to Daniel he speaks to haughty young King Belshazzar. And as he speaks to Belshazzar at a time when his music was stopped abruptly, he says, the one who gives you the very breath that you breathe, and the one who holds your bodily functions together, you've not even stopped to give him glory. You've not even stopped to give him thanks. The Bible says in Daniel 5, 24 to 27, Then was the part of the hand sent from him. And this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. <coughs> Mini, Mini, Tico, you fasten. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mini, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tico, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persia. Listen to Daniel as he speaks to Belshazzar. Here is what the writing means, O king. Tonight God is saying that you are through. God is telling you tonight your time is up. God is telling you outrightly, you are finished. Friends, make no mistake. The Bible is true to its word. Make no mistake, my friends. God is true to his word. For as sure as the music stopped, and as sure as Daniel spoke, that very night, Belshazzar's life was taken. My friends, <clears throat> as you see Belshazzar's body lying there dead in that banquet hall, I want you to realize anew that you cannot trifle with God. Today, the seriousness of it all is just as wrote, what is wrote on that wall, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Friends, God is saying to each of us today, you are weighed in the balances and are found wanting. Notice this. <coughs> Belshazzar was not weighed up in the balances of public opinion. You see, the people would have said he was a good statesman. Belshazzar was not weighed up in the balances of his own estimation, for he thought himself to be a mighty fine fellow. He was weighed up in the balances of God. God examined him and said, in my sight, you are altogether rotten. Today, I want you to understand that just like Belshazzar, you and I are weighed in the balances and found wanting. We need to realize that God's law is on one side of the balance and our lives are on the other side of the balance. You see, God speaks clearly. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make a graven image. 
You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You shall not dishonor your parents. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. This is all on one side of the balance, and then we are on the other side of the balance. And today I ask you, how does your life measure up? How does my life measure up? You know, I looked at the Bible, God's Word, and it told me that we are in big trouble. Because in Isaiah 64 verse 6, it told me, but we are all as an unclean thing, for all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Friends, things are bad. For all our trying, for all our attempts, as good as we think we are, as good as we think we can get, my Bible tells me that all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You know, there's a verse in the Bible... In Romans 5 verse 8. And it's a verse that I cannot do without. It's a verse that speaks to me when I consider that all my righteousnesses are as filthy rags. The Bible says in Romans 5 verse 8, But God commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. My friends, sin costs. Sin costs. You probably heard <coughs> of the young man who decided to rob the corner shop, put together a neat plan to give the shopkeeper a 10 pound note and get her to open the cash drawer to give him change. And then when he opened the cash drawer, he would grab all the money and run. Well, friends, the plan worked right down to a T. He got everything in the drawer, a total of four pounds and 34 pence. Left the shopkeeper with his 10 pound note <laughs> and actually lost out to the tune of five pounds and 66 pence. <clears throat> you see, the undeniable truth is that sin never gives you what it promises. It always returns less than the sinner invests. Romans 5 verse 8, But God commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, because of our sin, we are weighed in the balances and found wanting. But the good news today is, <coughs> for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life friends god loves us god loves us you know i was reading about one ed marquay and he tells the story of when he was just a little boy he says he and his friends were out in the backyard of John Adams' house, and he says we were in his backyard playing softball. He says John Adams was pitching, and he pitched that ball to me, and I hit that ball so high, and it flew high, high, high across the fence, right through Pearly Demore's picture window. <coughs> he says Pearly Demore was the chief of police in our little town. And he was called Pearly because of the handle on his handgun was made of mother of pearl. He knew that he should go next door and confess, but no, he ran. He says, we ran to the Central Park a few blocks away and hid underneath the green bandstand in the center of the park. He says, soon they saw the old police car driving around the block. They, they got nervous <coughs> and soon they saw those black pants with those shoes coming towards the bandstand. He says we watched those legs kneel down and pretty soon he was looking into the very face of Pearly Demore. 
his gestures telling him to come out, put them in the police car and took them down to the local jail. Pearlie DeMore telephoned his dad, Ed Marquay Sr., and said, Mr. Marquay, we have a problem with your son. Would you come to the police station immediately? When his father came down, Pearly DeMore said, I just replaced that window and it cost me 300 pounds. Ed said he was stunned. He thought to himself, I'm only young. How could I ever pay for that window? I looked at the bars, he said. I looked at the jail and I thought I would be there for all eternity, but for my father simply saying, I will pay the bill. Friends, sometimes the debt is so big you can't pay for it. And somebody has to pay it for you. And friends, <clears throat> aren't you glad that God made an arrangement to pay our debt for your sins? Friends, just like the Belshazzar, the same is true for us. There is coming a day when our party will end and the music will stop. You know, the children will know that at almost every children's party, there's a game that's always played. The game is musical chairs. And I like to watch when there are only just a few chairs in the middle and the children have to run around. And then when the music stops, there's a mad scramble to get the chair to sit on by any means necessary. Today I want to tell you, just like for Belshazzar, the same is true for us. There is a day coming when our party will end and the music will stop. There's coming a time when the writing will be on the wall for each of us. There will come a time when God will end all things and whatsoever state we are in, he will meet us. And friends, there will be no opportunity for any mad scramble. If we have not turned our lives over to him, then the fate of Belshazzar for sure is ours. Friends, we are living in serious times. The world is only interested in <coughs> Belshazzar's banquet, lifestyle, party, party, party. The world is only interested in having a good time. The world only tells you to live it up, enjoy yourself. That's the true motto of this world. But friends, I'm here today to tell you that there is coming a time when all partying and living it up will stop and many will be frightened like Belshazzar when they see that handwriting on the wall. Friends, there is coming a day for all of us. And we will see the writing on the wall for ourselves. The bottom line for each of us today is thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. That's the bottom line. But the good news is, Romans 5 verse 8, but God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. As I close, the story is told from Scotland of a mother's dramatic rescue of her child. Workmen were blasting rock in a quarry. And one day after they had attached the fuse and retired to a safe place and gave the alarm, they saw a three-year-old child <coughs> wandering across the open space where danger threatened. Friends, every passing second meant death was closing in on that child. The workmen called to the child. The workmen waved their arms at the child, but only looked on, the child only looked on their antics as something of amusement. But no man dared run forward knowing that the explosion was only seconds away. 
Friends, the child most certainly would have been killed had not his mother appeared at this moment of crisis. Friends, taking the situation at a glance, she did what a mother's heart dictated. She didn't run forward towards her son to yell to frighten him. Instead, she just knelt down, opened wide her arms, and smiled for him to come. And instantly, the child ran towards her. Within seconds, the area shook with the force of the explosion, yet the child was safe in his mother's arms. Friends, what a picture of the grace of God. What a picture of the cross. With outstretched arms on the cross, Jesus gives his gracious invitation to the world, indicating <coughs> that we are to come before the music stops, and he promises eternal safety. Friends, will you come to Jesus? Will you come? Today, the concluding word before the music stops for any of us is there is hope. God has sent me here today to tell you there is hope. And he knows what you're going through and what the future holds. But as long as Jesus lives, there is hope. Amen. There is hope, so hold on, there is hope, God has sent me here to tell you. telling us that our lives are not all that but the good news is that we have an opportunity before the music stops to place our lives in the hands of Jesus Christ I think that tells us there's hope there's hope irrespective of what your life is going through what your life is mixed up in there's hope it tells us that God has given us time and today we just want to have a prayer. All you want to do today is to say, Lord, I want to pray.
put my life in your hands before the music starts. And so that if that's you today, you just want to put your life in Jesus' hands. Just invite you to come forward. You just want to put your God life in Jesus' hands. The seriousness. You just want to put your you life there in Jesus' hands. through this story of Belshazzar it emphasized to me the shortness of life one minute Belshazzar was on the up aspiring the next moment his life was just cut off and in his lifetime he never failed he failed to give God the credence that was due him we are alive and now is the time to put our lives in God's hands. And so today if you have looked at your life and you recognize you're weighed in the balance and you recognize you're found wanting, found wanting I just invite you to come. Just invite so you to hold on, come. there just is come. hope. Position. God has sent look at where you are and then look at where God wants you, you to be. There is hope. You to come wherever you are. So no matter what you're going through or what the future holds, as long as Jesus lives. evangelistic series and uh, the whole purpose of that series is really just to create a season for decisions to be made for Jesus Christ it may be that you've not yet made a decision to follow Jesus Christ all the way but it might be that the spirit is prompting you and saying that now is the time for you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. If that's you, I invite you to come. Just look at Belshazzar, Belshazzar and the fact that he was standing one minute, the music stopped, and he was dead the next. It tells us about the seriousness of life, and it tells us more about the seriousness of God. It tells us for sure that nothing and no one will last forever. It tells us that there is coming a time when God will say enough and this world will end. And whatsoever state he finds you in, that will dictate your fate. And so today, if you have not yet walked through the waters of baptism, I invite you just to press through this crowd and just make an indication and we will do what we can so that you can fulfill and uh, take your stand to follow Jesus Christ all the way. So if that's you, if that's you, wherever you are, young people, there not time to be hedging and halting, senior people, so if you've not yet made a decision, invite you to come wherever you are. Is there somebody not yet made a decision God for Jesus Christ? Me here is there somebody?
I lingered and expressed the call is because that is the whole purpose of this church's existence. To extend invitations to those who have not yet given their life to Jesus Christ. If we don't do it, we fail in our responsibility. We are commissioned to go and we're commissioned to spread the good news. We're commissioned to give opportunities to individuals to give their lives to Jesus Christ. And so today, I want you just to take a moment. The last chorus will be sang. And I want you to take a moment. Young people, if you're not giving your life to Jesus Christ, now is the time. Don't think that you're far away from your music being stopped. Senior people, if you've not yet given your life to Jesus Christ, don't think that your music won't stop. Today, I urge you, if you've not yet made that decision, we will do what we can to help you. Let's have one more chorus and then we'll pray. There is hope, so hold on. There is hope. Thank you for the fact that you love us so much. You love us so much that you don't want any of us to perish. We thank you for the warning that you've given to us through the experience of Belshazzar. Helping us to recognize that for each of us, sooner or later, the music will stop. Help us, Lord, to recognize the time that we have is now. When the music is stopped, it will be too late. And Lord, I pray for any who have not yet given their life to you, that your spirit will just move upon them, that you will urge them that now is the time. Help them to recognize that when they take one step towards you, you take two to meet them. Lord, help us all to realize that whatever we are going through, as long as Jesus lives, there's hope. Hope for every situation. And Lord, as we move up and down the pews, we know that there are many situations here today. Many difficulties, many worries, many frustrations many perplexities. But Lord, we bow before you because we recognize more and more that there's nothing too hard for the Lord. And so, Lord, I pray that each of us will just surrender our situations to you, recognizing that our hope lies in none other than Jesus Christ. Bless us to this end, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So hold on, there is hope, God has sent me here to tell. As long as 
Jesus lives, as long as Jesus lives.